Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for me that the words that come out of my mouth are yours. And Lord, for all the words that we hear, they are your words and we are changed by them as we walk out of here. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So can we remember which book we're looking at or letter? Don't be subtle. Come on. It was only seven days ago. James. We were looking at James. Absolutely. So if you'd like to turn to James chapter 2, please, or find it in your app or whatever. And while you're doing that, I'll just remind you of the background that James was a leader of the Jerusalem church. He was also the half-brother of Jesus. The letter is meant for Jewish Christians, those who were Jewish and became Christians, who are now living in Gentile cities due to the persecution that was described in Acts 8. They had to flee Jerusalem because there was a persecution that broke out upon the church. The letter, somewhere about the late 40 AD. And also the letter, if you look at the letter and the teachings in Matthew 5 to 7, the Beatitudes, you can see there is a distinct uh, uh, underpinning from Jesus' teaching in James's letter. So, can we remember, who was here last week? Come on. Don't be un... Ah, thank you. Can we remember last week what it was about? Jane, bless you. That we should be slow to anger. Thank you. Slow to anger. Anybody else? Does that sort of... And slow to speak. Which you're all exhibiting now by not answering the question. (laughs) Thank you, Marcy. Yes, that was not the word I want you to respond to. Yes, I titled it Quick, Slow, Slow. This is a tribute to Strictly Come Dancing and equally to hopefully how our ears should be quick to listen, we should be slow to speak and slow to become angry. We should also be doers of the word, not just listeners of it. So hopefully you were putting into practice what you learnt last week. But by the slow response, I'm not quite sure if you learnt from last week. So let's see if we can try again today. Slow down my talk, was that? I can't. Oh, it's slow to get in, is it? Okay, fine. We'll pick up again. And also the first thing we notice, it's not just being doers, but it actually should change us on the inside. The Bible that we read, the relationship we have with Jesus should change us on the inside as well. And we'll come to more of that as we go along. So we sort of finished on one chapter, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 27. I just want to reread that. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after, our, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So, this is a real question, expecting a real answer to. What pollutes us as Christians? What pollutes us? Just thought you needed some help. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing that pollutes us is the values that are taken for granted in society around us. So, for example, uh, material things are more important than spiritual things, the whole consumerist thing. The I as an individual are more important than we as a group, so the whole individual thing as well. Yeah, that would be the two big ones. Thank you. Sometimes things we watch on TV and digesting it instead of letting letting it dispel from our body. Thank you. Anybody else? It should be. um, This is not, this should be as Christians an answer we should be able to give fairly easy. Why? 
because it's something we should always be on the lookout for. We're called to sort of, you know, we love Ephesians 6 maybe and, you know, to shoot down the arrows of the flaming one and all this sort of thing. But if we don't know what the arrows look like, if we don't know what it is that can take us down and pollute us, if we can't name it, how do we know it's there? It just, it should be as, uh, it should be something we should respond to as Christians. I know what that is. I know what pollutes me. I know what it is in the world that can undermine my cr- Christian walk. Just thought I'd mention that. So what pollutes us? Well, I think James has got something to say. So let's read. Could you read with me? James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. My brothers, and it should be also, and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, you... Uh, but you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, not, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. It is not the... Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Actually, I'll re-repeat that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Because there is an explanation mark in the NIV. First opening verses of chapter 2. Originally, the letter would never have been broken up into chapters and verses. It was just one big letter. There's no subheadings, which really makes this sometimes unhelpful when you want to read this letter. But it links this links back to verse uh, to 27, pollution. I've already said there's actually multiple ways pollution comes. Pastor David gave some big examples, and then when you sort of break that, say, consumerism down into its various components, it gets even list gets even longer and wider. It does come in many forms, and it would be really easy to read James here when he talks about the rich person and think, ah, this is an absolute rule. He's talking about showing favoritism to a rich person. Well, he isn't, because in verse 1 he says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus, don't show favoritism. Suppose, in verse 2, i.e., e.g., for example, and then he starts talking about the rich man and the poor. It's an example story, he's showing an example. Not an absolute rule. He's talking about, when you take that example and the rest of that passage, showing partiality. Showing I favour this over this person. I favour that person over this person. He's using it as one example.
is use an example to say that if you uh, are showing favor to one person over another and above another, it's like saying that God loves that person you're highly regarding more than the person that you're not regarding nicely. And he's talking to Christians. Saying it's very easy that you're looking at the rich person, is this example, and you saying, I love that person more. And because I think that person's better, God clearly loves that person better as well because they're rich. That's showing partiality, showing favoritism. This is what James is trying to point out as an example story. So could you imagine a rich person walking into this church and we all fawning over them? And we all go, no, 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 don't do that. But believe you me, we are polluted by the world. I've got a fantastic example story, a real life one, that to this day makes me laugh and cry. Happened just over 12 years ago. And I'm going to only mention the fact that uh, it was uh, Joy and I were going out um, with somebody that we know really, really well. I'm deliberately going to protect the identity of the person. Uh, it's not somebody from this church, I hasten to add. And uh, we were going out with them uh, to do some shopping up in London. Uh, just prior to, or I think it was just after Christmas, I can't quite remember what it was, but I know the sales was on, and we needed some electrical goods, uh, we needed it for our kitchen, we needed, uh, I think, a toaster, if my memory serves correctly, and um, the sale was on, we knew the particular toaster, and we wanted to go to one of these big department stores, um, uh, we could have gone to any one of the department stores around the country, but we thought we'd make a bit of a day of it with this person that we know really well, and have a spot of lunch and everything else, yeah, do that sort of thing, so we thought, let's do that, and uh, I decided, you know something, I, I, I'm, I'm going to sort of get a bit better dressed. I'm not just going to go in my jeans and T-shirt. Um, I'll actually uh, maybe put on a shirt on and, and, and a nice jacket on, which I hasten to add, by the way, would have come from, when I mean nice, I mean probably the ones that have been washed <laughs> and ironed. Uh, let's not get away that there's some expensive clothing from some expensive shop. But I thought we'd try and look vaguely smart. Now, this particular person we know has a very good job in London and uh, back then and was earning a fair wage. They didn't flaunt it, they didn't throw it around, they weren't like that at all. But you could see by the clothes they naturally wear, they don't come from the local supermarket. I'll just leave it at that. But it's not because they flaunt it, it's just that's part of their dress code. Now, what was really funny, we were going out and uh, we had to pick this person up. They'd been out for the night before. We were picking them up and we were going into London. There's a point of this story was that they threw their, literally threw what they had on, threw their big overcoat on, which, to be honest, looked like it could have gone with going in the dry cleaners. It just, just had that look about it. I just looked and I thought, okay. So that was it. We went out. Not disdainfully, I just, just noted it. And we went into the, we went into the shop, went into the department store, and there's me and Joy frantically looking on the shelving, wanting to buy something, saying, yeah, it's checking that good out, checking that goods out. And this person was with us as well, and they sort of walked off to do their own bit of kitchen shopping as well. And they only want to buy a little thing. And we were looking there thinking, oh, this toast that this will be nice, and maybe uh, get the kettle to match it as well, because our house had gone all wrong. That was the point. Everything had broken. And as we're looking, we're thinking, great. Now, I don't know about you, but when you go into a store, how often do you get pounced by the salespeople when you don't want them? But when you want them, hello? Guess what happened? We're like, no, 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 couldn't, couldn't. There's nobody, go, hello, no. <laughs> Not. This person we, we, who we were with, who looked like their shoes could have done with a polish as well, um, as I said, was clearly had a late night the night before. Got jumped on by the salespeople. Hello, can we help you? What, what can we help you with? And I'm like, okay. And we sort of sidelined. And anyway, they, they bought their item. They went up to uh, the counter and, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, sir, no problem, sir. It was all like that. And I'm like, hello? Hello? What made me laugh, and this will make you giggle, even to the point when they're getting their card out, their credit card to pay for it. They pulled out a toothbrush out of their pocket as well. <laughs> to give you an idea, all right? It was purely because they're obviously out the night before, you know, and they knew what they were, they were kipping somewhere else, and so they thought, well, they'd take something to clean it too. And I just looked, and I thought, okay, fine. 
And do you know what the point is? There was a reason. The shopkeepers were trained to spot those who were clearly in good clothing, i.e. clothing. They were trained to spot the people who have clearly got money by what they're wearing, no matter how scruffy it might have looked. It, obviously, that this person had a decent back pocket. We in society are trained to look out for those people. You may not believe it, but by the clothing. I bet if you watch fashion advertisements on TV, I bet when you're out and about, you know that whether that comes from a, a local designer store or that comes from a supermarket, yeah? We're trained, our eyes by our adverts are trained to spot these things. That is being polluted by the world. We are trained to do this. We just don't know it half the time. People that work in shop stores sometimes are trained, and if anybody here does work in, in that, I think sometimes you, it depends on where your, your London store is or where your store is, sometimes you're trained to look out for those. I did walk out of there with a sense of, okay, next time I'll just go in scruffy, see what happens next, I better get kicked out. So what James is opening up with here is an example about how we show partiality, how we look at the rich and we might favour them. And we might be sitting there going, no, I don't do that. But remember, this is just an example. There are other ways that all of us show favouritism. All of us. It could be that you might... Uh, naturally congregates to somebody of your own culture. Or somebody who does the same profession as you. And you might ignore people who do professions that you think might be beneath you. We all show, in one form or another, partiality. And James is trying to point out that this should not be so. You have become judges already, he says, with evil thoughts. Now, James is also saying, by my brothers, I, he also should be saying, and my sisters. Let me explain. The NIV translates the Greek, just my brothers. But actually, that really is a neutral term. It is both inclusive. When it was used back then, it meant both male and female. So, um, my sisters, just read that as, and yourselves as well. As believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, that line that you see right at verse one is emphasizing the reader's status. You are my brothers and sisters of our glorious Lord Jesus. It is saying that you are citizens of another kingdom. You are part of another realm that plays by different rules. As you read this letter, that is what his opening gambit is here. He's saying that you are members of God's household. That is what he's saying. When he says, my brothers, that's the opening line, and sisters. But what he's saying is by this statement, glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, that is a term you don't see really anywhere else in this glorious bit in such a later on in the letter. And he's trying to emphasize the fact that our Lord Jesus is glorious, not just he's in glory, he is glorious, he is Lord. If you favor the rich person who is not yet a member of God's household. And you are therefore then undermining the glorious Lord. He's trying to point out that God, or Lord Jesus, is vastly higher than anybody else on the earth, and especially better and higher than the rich person. Therefore then, if you favour in church, oh, come rich person, come, come and sit. Oh, poor person, floor. What you're saying is, you've made a judgment call, and you're saying that the Lord Jesus is a nobody. 
though he's glorious, because he came poor. Do you understand? He's trying to point out that you're a member, your citizenship is actually in God's household. So if we turn around and say, I am part of God's household, and yet you show favoritism to one or two people that come into the church, you're actually saying your citizenship really lies in this world rather than the new kingdom that is coming. Because you'll rather be nice to the rich person or to somebody from your own culture, and you would look and ignore somebody else who may not be rich. The point is, it's not that we will get many really super rich people in this building, or you may do, or we might do. We make flipping remarks sometimes. Oh, it'd be lovely to have that superstar being a member of our church. Imagine their tithing. <laughs> ah, you see, look. And sometimes we might want to favour somebody who appears to be in power because they might give us a career boost. Or might advance our, um, our standing in society if we sort of suck up to them, basically, a little bit more. Be a bit extra nice to them because we want something from them. James is saying in, in that whole, if you do that, what you're doing, you're not saying you're part of God's household at all. You're sinning. You're saying your citizenship lies in this world, not in God's. And we'll keep going with that thought as we go. Verses 5 to 7, which we've already read and I won't read again. James is saying, this gives an example. He, sorry, right at the beginning, he's given an example of what favoritism can look like between the rich and the poor. But be honest with you, he's probably using a real example that's actually really happening. We all use examples of stories whenever you're preaching. And if you're being honest, there are times you'll, you know that actually in real life that's really happening somewhere. And it's a shame. We don't just pluck these things out of thin air. You know, it is true. It's happening around the world. It might be happening in churches. but most certainly will be happening in society. So he's probably actually trying to show us also in this letter exactly what's really happening in the churches that he's writing to. Saying you're showing favoritism to the rich. Why? Well, as I said earlier, they had been, this is Jewish Christians who had been persecuted and dispersed out into the Gentile towns. They've got no real money. They're also being persecuted while they're there as well, because they're Christians. They're talking about this Lord Jesus who's Lord over Caesar, that's not going to go very well. The Jews also don't like it neither, so they're persecuting them as well. So you can understand, I think, maybe, that if you suddenly start having a rich person coming into your church, i.e. somebody with influence and power in the town, you might want to see if you can suck up to them a little bit. See if you can get some protection from them. See if you can become their friend. Rub shoulders. Yeah? James is saying, you do this. These are the very same people who are insulting the name of Jesus. As he makes it very clear, he says... Are they not, talking about the rich people, the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? You're showing these people favoritism as they come into your church. Yet they could be next week dragging you to court. And by the way, it's not like courts in this country. It will be a court where you'll probably get flogged and you could get crucified or head hacked off, burned, stoned. So you're showing them favouritism, are you? 
These very people that next week could be dragging you off to court. You see for James, there's a sense of how daft is that? Why are you doing that? Don't do it. Now, let's just try and bring it into today just a little bit because there is a difference between showing love and showing favoritism. I would expect our welcoming team to welcome everybody equally. Yeah? Would you expect that? And I'd expect us as church to always welcome everybody equally. And all of those, maybe you'll get the church, they'll come in, they'll go, hi, welcome, welcome, come, let's give you a seat. So you can imagine in James's example, it was, come, oh, you're rich, oh, come with me. Come down here, oh, here's a special seat just for you. Okay, that's James's example. So let's go with our example. Hi, welcome, actually it doesn't work for us, do you know why? Because everybody gets dragged down to the front, no matter who you are, because nobody here ever takes up the front seats. I keep explaining, these are the more comfortable ones because they get used less. <laughs> but we would equally expect when we walk in here that we should all be treated equally, no matter whether we clearly or evidently got lots of money, we've just pulled up in our Ferrari or we've just pulled up in our older car. I was just about to name a car and I thought, hang on, I could insult somebody, so I won't. Our Trabant, there you go, that's an old car, nobody's got any of those. Right, and probably nobody knows what I'm talking about. We would expect to be treated equally. Just as a sideline, by the way, just very quickly, uh, Pastor Dave and myself have no idea who are the rich and the poor. We don't know what you tithe, we haven't got a clue. So we can't be accused of showing favouritism ever. Okay? And I'm not that into fashion, I know exactly what looks good and what doesn't look good. As my wife will portray for you. But we would not want that to happen. We would want everybody to be showed equally. We would want to walk in, no matter how we're dressed, how we look, and be treated as a favourite. Because God looks at all equally and loves us all equally. And we go, yes, in church, fine. We'd never show favouritism in church. We'd never, ever suddenly see somebody with money, some big pop star walk in here and go, oh, hello. Does that sound a bit creepy, Carol? It's well practiced. Right. But here's the modern equivalent, I think, for James. You're in work, college, friendship group, whatever. Somebody who's got power and influence. You're a member of God's household. The glorious Lord Jesus Christ is your king, your ruler, your saviour, your helper in every time of trouble. Amen? Amen? But in your workplace, your manager, your president, your GM, whatever. In your college, your tutor, your principal. You're extra nice to them because they will give you a career leg up. You're extra nice to your tutor because they might give you a few extra percentage or fight your corner in your exam. Yet your work colleagues, those on the same level as you or below you, no, I'm not helping you today. Oh, yes, hi, boss. Oh, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, I'll go and run and do that stapling for you. Oh, yeah, I know it's not normally my job. and I normally leave that to the admin staff. But yes, I'll go and do that for you. Oh, well, sorry, you want me to do yours as well, do you? Oh, sort of junior. No, 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 go do it yourself. And don't laugh, because it happens. I think that's the modern equivalent. And James saying, for those bosses... Those whoever you suck up to, they could be the following week dragging you to the 
HR department because you have confessed Jesus Christ. You've said something nice about Jesus. You've done something. And they're the very people that will drag you in a HR to get you into trouble. You're a member of God's household. That is your citizenship. That is where you reside. You shouldn't be playing by the economic rules of our companies and businesses. You shouldn't be sucking up unduly to your bosses. You also, I would suggest, and I'm going to be very cautious here, but you should also not be within your friendship society, family, showing over favoritism to those who might have some influence within the friendship group. You should love everybody equally. It's no different. Works all the same way. Bullies are normally the people that we tend to want to suck up to because we want to be on their good side. I think there's an equivalent here for James. Why? They're as much as stab you and bully you in the back the next day if they got nobody else to pick on. You're part of God's household. God is your Lord. Comment I like from one of the commentators, Stulak, says, James has fixed the spotlight on the dangerous role of wealth. Christians who seriously desire to be doers of this word will be more earnest in practicing the law that is higher than the law of economic power. Whether we like it or not, I believe that sometimes when we go into work, or wherever, benefits office, whatever you do, social friendship group, I think sometimes those that have got influence, you'll sort of drop your kingdom-like status and show favoritism to them. James is saying, no. Why do that? Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. What's the royal law? Jesus. James is writing, he could be talking about the Old Testament. But he's not talking about ceremonial law, sacrifice of animals for sins and all that. He's not talking about. He's talking about moral law. Moral law being love your neighbor as yourself. Or the better phrase we do these days, do to others as you would like be done to yourself. Yeah? You show favoritism. Nobody wants to be trounced on by somebody else. You don't want to be ignored, do you? Akin, you wouldn't want me to ever ignore you in favor of um, Andy, would you? Could you be a bit more convicted in that, please? No. no. And I wouldn't want that to happen to me. I wouldn't want Andy to ignore me in favor of Akin. That's love your neighbor as yourself. You show favoritism, you are not fulfilling that commandment, says James. If you show partiality in any way, shape, or form, you are not fulfilling the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So then he goes into this whole, um, uh, carries on talking about, but if you show favoritism, you sin, are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. What he's getting at is no saying, good saying, I love my neighbor as myself, yet just this one person, I will show favoritism. You've broken the whole law. You have broken the rule, loving neighbor as yourself. 
then he uses a really extreme example that we'd go, oh, but murder is worse than committing adultery, surely. But notice he flips it the other way. He says, you might well uh, not commit adultery, but if you commit murder, you've broken the whole law. And we're going, well, yeah, that's obvious to us, surely. He's saying it's just as equally strong. So what's the solution? Firstly, speak and act, verse 12, as those who are being going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Here's a fun subject for you. We're all going to be judged. Oh, that wasn't as... We're all going to be judged. Therefore, we should all speak and act as ones who are going to be judged. Now, if you're a Christian, you know you're saved, but you still have to give account for how you act and what you say. So therefore then, we should speak and act as ones who know there is an ultimate judge, i.e. our glorious Lord Jesus. So James is saying, actually, the way to deal with this, because you're going to be judged by the law that actually gives you freedom, so be free by being merciful, by not judging, by not showing favoritism, actually give mercy to everyone. Treat everybody equally. Stulak says, our relationships are corrupted by the sin in our character that leads us to approach people with fear, calculation, judgmentalism, and manipulation for our self-interest. Our relationships are corrupted by the sin in our character that leads us to approach people with fear, calculation, judgmentalism, and manipulation for our self-interest. How many times did you look at someone, you make immediate, you assess them by looking at them straight away? It's apparently true, apparently, for interviews. I think it's within the first 30 seconds or something. You've already been judged, assessed, and whether you've got the job or not, that's pretty much it. That's normally the norm. Why is that? You don't know me yet. Ah, because it's the way that we approach people. It's the way that you dress, maybe the way that you look. Do I like, let's be honest, do I like your skin color? Do I like your hair color? Do I like bald people? Do I like people with hair? Do I like the tie that they're wearing or the blouse that they're wearing? We make judgments by looking at people within 30 seconds. And we normally approach people, normally, with a tentative, right, okay, hmm, judgment, what can you do for me? Are you worth knowing? In one form or another, we've always done it. Now, as you grow in your maturity with Christ, it should be, God loves you, hi. You don't actually go up to them, hi, God loves you, but you know what I mean? In your backdrop, you should be looking at them as the image of God. But I think we all approach people with some sense of making a judgment, fear. I was in a high street this week, uh, not in Greenford, somewhere else, and um, I had my uh, clerical collar on. I was standing waiting for some uh, fellow uh, pastors for a meeting, and a gentleman came up to me and as I was standing there, he came up to me and um, he made an instant judgment about me just by the clothing that I was wearing. 
by the time we ended that, and I could have easily made an instant judgment about him because he came with a can in his hand, wasn't clearly able to walk particularly straight. And I could have made an instant judgment. I've gone, oh my life, this is somebody I do not want to talk to. This is going to be a waste of my time. You can make that judgment. But actually, no. This is somebody that Jesus wants to spend time with. He's not going to do anything for me, but let's see if I can do something for him. And that's how we should be. Merciful. Not self-interested, but be merciful. And this is what James is saying. Don't show it favoritism do not be self-interested it's the only reason you show favoritism it's the only reason you show partiality is because it fulfills your self-interest your selfishness you suck up to your boss you do that because you want a promotion you don't want to lose your job you want a bigger pay packet apparently go to richard branson he's going take a holiday whenever you want it But James is saying, no, be merciful, do not be self-interested. And this is where we're now going to go into verses 14 to 26. We're not going to go to it too in depth because it's one that most of us read and it gets so misconstrued. Remember what I said at the beginning? This is a whole letter. It would not have been broken down into chapters and verses and paragraphs with paragraph heading. This is not an essay. This was a letter. So it would have just naturally carried on with, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, sorry, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodgings to the spies and sent them off to a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This passage is sometimes taken in isolation because it is separated by a header, faith and deeds, in the NIV, before it reaches to the end of chapter 2. And some people read that as meaning that actually you're not saved by faith alone. You've got to be doing all the time to be saved. It's your works that saves you. It's what you do for God that saves you, not just faith in him. That's not what James is saying. If you take it at its whole package of what we've just read about showing partiality and favoritism, and earlier on in chapter one, when he talks about being doers of the word, it's saying if you claim to have faith in Christ, saying that I am part of the household of God, but you then show partiality, your statement about being part of God's household is false because the actions you are performing, for example, favoritism, prove that you are not part of God's household. You're breaking the rules. It's about that your faith, i.e. in God and God alone, should inform your actions. And it goes deeper than favoritism here for James. If you do not show mercy, for instance... 
You're not living out the word of God. You're not living out the faith that you profess. We want God to show us mercy, don't we? So if the royal law is love your neighbor as yourself, you should be showing mercy. If you don't show mercy, then you're not showing faith in Christ. What James is basically saying in verses 14 to 18 is that attending church every Sunday and professing to be a Christian, but not having your life shaped by the Bible and your life life shaped by a relationship with Jesus is not faith because there's no evidence or outworking of your faith the other six days of the week. There's no devotional life. There's no practical care for others. There's no active involvement in, against injustice. If you just come to church and go away again, where's, where's your faith? Why, where's your faith shaping, shaping your life? If you show favoritism to other people, then your life is not being shaped by Christ. You have to be a doer, i.e. somebody who actually reads this word, has a relationship with Jesus, and it should shape the way you live your life. the way you treat others, the way you love others. There's a sense for James of saying that this faith without deeds is saying that you're not mature enough in Christ if you are not doing the things that God is asking you to do. We believe very much in this church, actually you grow in spiritual maturity, in spiritual maturity, by actually being somebody who is exercising the gifts that God has given you. If you're not doing anything for Christ, or doing anything at all, then your maturity is not going to grow. There's no output going on. It's great coming here Sunday and listening to the word, but if you're not outputting it as well equally, you're not growing. You're just coming in, praising God, thank you very much, going home again. There's no shaping. You might look good on a Sunday, but James is saying you've got to be a doer of the word. That's how you know that your faith is real. And that's what he's saying. Oh, you say you have your deeds, but I show you my faith by what I do for God. And it's not just about a Sunday. It's not just about coming here and serving the church or serving your gifts within here on Sunday. It's talking about what you do outside And if you wrap up the package about here showing favoritism and partiality, you have to be straight down the middle in all your relationships with people. And he uses three examples very quickly. Demons believe in Jesus. And they're scared, by the way. They shudder. But they do not follow him. They do not submit to him. They do not even work for him. But they do actually believe in him. But they just have a knowledge of him. So actually, James is almost saying here, faith without deeds is basically demonic. Because they believe in Jesus, but they don't do anything for him, and they're demons. Now, I want to really, it's quite extreme to say, if you say you have faith, but you don't do anything with it, you're not a doer of God's word, it's not shaping you internally, that's almost demonic, that's a little bit on the strong side, but there is this sense of, don't just come in and just, just, just do nothing. Faith without deeds is dead. He uses then two other examples, Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and Rahab, a prostitute from a foreign nation. And he says, yet yeah, equally both of them showed great faith by what they did. For Abraham, he completed becoming righteous because he was willing to sacrifice his son. Because he was willing to follow exactly what God wanted him to do. Rahab equally, prostitute, foreign nation, invading Israel, just about to come in, shelters the Jewish spies. And it was credited to her as a faithful servant. 
Why? Because she morally saw there was a need and she did something about it. To a foreigner's. She actually went against her own people. She actually sacrificed almost her own life. She could have really, you know, got killed by what she did by her own people. She didn't favour her own nation. She clearly favoured what God wanted to happen. She showed mercy. These are the examples that James is using. So when you read this passage and you think, oh, I've got to be doing more. Clearly, this is what James is saying. I'm not saved by my grace of God unless I'm doing, doing, doing. That's not what he's saying. He's saying your doing comes out of your faith, comes out of your relationship because you're listening to God. But if you're just coming and professing being a Christian, not doing anything at all, then it's dead. And actually, if you don't do anything, there is no spiritual maturity. That sounds really harsh, but it's true. You develop your relationships first. Your identity is in your citizenship with God, but he does expect you to do something. And you need to hear him. Now, not everybody has to do everything. Some of us are given one gift. Some of us are given ten gifts. You use that one gift faithfully. That's fine. You use those 10 gifts faithfully. That is equally fine. There is no difference in God's sight. So I don't want people running out of here going, oh, I must do more, I must do more, panicking they're not doing enough. It's actually with God that you are meant to sit and ask him first, what do you want me to do? So we are saved by grace. We are safe because of our faith in Jesus. But he does expect us to do things. And one of the things I think he expects us to do is not show favoritism, but actually to love everybody equally. Let's pray. Lord, I remember actually one of the worship songs this morning about uh, us being light in the world. And you call us, Lord, to not play by the world's rules, but to play by your rules. Not to show partiality, not to show favoritism, Lord, but to love everybody equally. I pray for each of us here this morning, Lord. As this sermon has been somewhat hard-hitting, Lord, we do walk out of here knowing that we are saved by grace, but knowing we're also meant to be doers of your word. Be light in our society. Be light in our companies. Be light in our families. I pray for each and every one of us, Father, in the name of Jesus, that that will become a living reality this week. Lord, point out to us where maybe we're not making you to be our glorious Lord in the areas of our lives that we live. But also, Lord, I pray that you will point out to us where we are doing exactly what it is you want us to do. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.